Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the online service of Gateway Freedom Church. You might be aware that clocks went back last night, one hour. I hope you enjoyed that extra hour, whatever you did. Or perhaps you haven't realized that the clocks went back and time has altered. Well, time has traveled and what was in the present has moved into the past by one hour. 10.30 was 11.30. Or is that just the future? Confused? I'm sorry. Anyway, back to now, back to reality. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1, it says, For everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven. And last Sunday we had our AGM and Thanksgiving service, which was good. We particularly gave thanks for all that God has done in this place in this building. But we also gave thanks to God for what he's done in our lives whilst meeting in this place. So let's continue to give thanks to God as Mauricio and Sabelli lead us in a time of praise and worship.
promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never will come to pass, Lord. We know that every single word you said about us will come to pass, Lord. So we choose to align ourselves, Lord. We choose to surrender. We choose to say yes to the things that you've spoken over us, Lord. individuals, as a family, as a church family, we say yes to the things that you spoke over us, Lord. Because we know that your thoughts for us are good. Your thoughts to give us a, a, a future and a hope. Just what to do, and I will love you, love. 
Thank you so much, Marisha and Sibeli. And thank you, Lord, for all that you have done, for all that you are doing, and for all that you're going to do. We particularly give thanks to God for the gifts, donations, and the tithes and the offerings that we've received here as a church to enable us to keep moving in the right direction and to do the work of the kingdom. So thank you to everyone for your offerings. God bless you. But if you would like to give and donate, then the details will pop up around here. But you can also find the details on the Gateway website under the Donate button. So let's just uh, pray and thank God for those tithes and offerings. Please join me. Lord, thank you for the building. Thank you for the gifts. Thank you for the tithes. And thank you for the offerings. Thank you for everything we've done here, Lord. For the nursery we had, the after school club, for everything we did to reach out to the community for the many services and meetings we've had here, the gatherings, the mission work that's gone out from here, and the mission work that we've supported across the world. And the many guest speakers that have come here and brought wonderful ministry and teaching. All this, Lord, we thank you since we've opened in 2005 to now, and we thank you for the future and our future home. Amen. If I could just um, make a notice about the big burn, details will pop up here. Uh, that's tomorrow night at 8 pm to 9 pm. That's 60 minutes to change the world. So when the clocks went back that one hour and you got that, uh, that hour from the past, you can use it to invest in the future. 60 minutes to change the world. And now, it's my great pleasure to welcome our guest speaker for today, Joanna Stainsby. May we have ears to hear and eyes to see what God is saying through Joanna.
Hello. Has God ever spoken to you and said something amazing over your life? Something so big, so wonderful that you just thought, wow, that's amazing. And then when the dust has settled, you thought, oh my goodness, how am I going to get from here to there? And if that didn't seem difficult enough, your life then seems to run screaming in the opposite direction. And a huge credibility gap opens up with you standing on one side of the precipice and the fulfillment of God's promise is on the other with no human way of getting across. Well, today the title of my talk is Pear-Shaped Promises. And if you can identify with this, you're in great company. Because Abraham, the father of faith, experienced the exact same thing. And today, as we look at his life, I hope we discover together that in the face of insurmountable problems, a very special opportunity opens up to us. So let's just uh, have a brief, brief background um, regarding Abraham and just quickly look a little bit at his story. So around 2100 BC, that's about 2000 years before Jesus came to the earth, Abraham and his wife Sarah were living in a place called Haran. And this is where God first speaks to Abraham and he calls Abraham to leave his people, his other relations, and to come out of that place, that godless culture, and to go somewhere where God would re reveal himself. And Abraham is obedient and he does as God asks him to. And this starts a very special relationship as God invites Abraham into this relationship with himself. And over a series of encounters, God makes a very special promise to Abraham, which has three parts. The first part is he promises to Abraham to make him the father of a great nation. Actually, it's not just a great nation, it's many nations. His descendants, God says, would be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore. The second part of the promise was that God would give Abraham and his descendants the land of Canaan, which we now know is Israel. And the third part of God's promise is that he, God promises to be with Abraham and his descendants and to bless him so mightily that he would be, Abraham, a blessing to all the families of the earth. And so God sets in motion the beginning of his restoration plan for the whole of humanity, choosing to start through this one man, Abraham. <clears throat> What an amazing promise over his life. But there were two problems. And if I'd had some lovely music playing while I was talking about those promises, this is the point where the uh, stylus of the record player would bump across the surface of the vinyl, causing a horrible scratching sound. Because these two problems were not just incidental things that could be gotten over. They were insurmountable, humanly speaking. The first one was that Abraham and his wife Sarah were actually getting on in years. Abraham was 75 years old when God first spoke to him and his wife was 65. And the second thing was Abraham and Sarah they had no children, no descendants to work with. And in fact, they couldn't conceive. 
So, given the promise of God to Abraham and the um, crucial part that is descendants, you start to think if God, whether God has actually picked the right guy. Of course he has. And it seems that God was not in a hurry to get the nation making underway either. It would be 25 years before Abraham and Sarah would hold their very own son Isaac in their arms. And between the promise being given and the promise being fulfilled, every morning of every day, of every week, of every month, of every one of those 25 years, Abraham and Sarah would have woken up to the fact that their bodies were decrepit and they grew more so every passing day and there was nothing, humanly speaking, they could do about it. So why did God choose Abraham and Sarah when they couldn't have children? Why did he actually speak to Abraham so late in his life, 75? And why, was it, why did God take so long to fulfill the promise once he'd given it? Why did God do it this way? Well, I believe it's because God wanted to cultivate in Abraham something far more precious, faith. And Paul, writing to Romans, actually has excellent insight into this, which we're going to read just now. We're going to read Romans 4, starting at verse 16. That is why the promise depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace, not works. You see, it was so important vital in fact that the promise depended on Abraham believing that God could do what he had said that nothing was impossible to God and that this the fulfillment of this promise would never be fulfilled by human works by human endeavors or by human action it rested on the pure grace of God and God fulfilling his promise to Abraham. And then that means it would be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, which is the Jews, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham who is the father of us all. So you see, Abraham wasn't just the physical father of the Jews and other nations. He was actually also the spiritual father of many because both were achieved through faith. And so the spiritual reproduction and the physical reproduction were both a product of Abraham believing that God could keep his promise and his word. Going back to the text, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. I've just got to read that bit again, because if that doesn't woo you, or wow you, whew, don't know what will. In the presence of the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Wow. In hope he believed, against hope. That simply means in hope he believed when all human hope was gone. It was hopeless. That he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. 
as numerous as the stars and as the grains of sand on the seashore. He did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Wow. From that, I would just like to draw out three uh, points that we can use in our life with the promises that God has given to us. And so the first one would be establish the promise. Now as Christians we have tremendous promises over our life that God has given us and some we share together, the big ones we share together, our very relationship with God rests upon the promise of salvation through Jesus and um, the new covenant in his blood. And there are promises of God throughout the Bible that are over us all. But then there are also the specific promises that God gives to us. Maybe it's just when you're reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit really enlightens something for you and you know that that word is for you, that word is over your life. Or maybe someone's given you a prophetic word or you've heard God speak a prophetic word to your own heart and you've, you've got that over your life. Well, these promises are so precious that they need to be up front and center because whatever God gives us, whether it be a promise and a word, whether it be a talent, whether it be an opportunity, what God gives us, we're responsible for. And, it's of the, and it is of the utmost importance how we respond to that gift. Now, sometimes life gets really busy. Sometimes we get distracted and waylaid. And sometimes these promises, they just get lost somehow and uh, start gathering a bit, bit of dust and, you know, just get a bit neglected. And then sometimes maybe we just put it down because actually life has become, the reality of life has become too painful to keep those promises with us. Or even you might have made the mistake of not taking on board the promise when it was given in the first place. And so it's just sitting there. Whatever the situation, if you have promises of God over your life that you know have gotten a bit neglected, then I urge you to find them and get them out. Get them back on the table and start a dialogue with your gracious Heavenly Father. You see, it's so important that these things are with us, are current, are up front and centre. And sometimes we need to be intentional about that. We need to write them down in places we will see them. We need to remind ourselves. We need to pray them and make them part of our quiet time. We need to cherish them and ponder them in our hearts. We need to love and embrace them because they need to frame our thought life and inform our decisions. We need to establish the promises of God. And the second point I'd like to draw out is that and help us on our, our, how we deal with our promises that God has given us is that we actually need to believe God for the fulfilment of those promises. And in that Romans um, verse four, uh, sorry, Romans chapter four, verse 18, it says that against all hope, Abraham believed and so became the father of many nations. 
So once we know and have established what promises God has given us, uh, then a door of opportunity actually opens up to us and we need to make a decision to believe God or not. Now to believe God entails an active upping and moving. We need to exercise our faith muscles. And if we, if, we, if we don't want to do that, if we just want to wait and see what happens, then I actually think that's not believing God. That's just waiting and seeing. And if you stay there, if you remain in the place that you're comfortable with, then you'll remain where you are and how you are. And you will be subject to limits and processes of the natural way of things. And not a lot will change. But on the other hand, if we actually do exercise that faith muscle and we get up and we walk through that door of opportunity, we actually walk and relocate ourselves into the faith realm of God. And in this faith realm where we say, yes, God, we believe what you've spoken over our lives. We don't know how you're going to do it. We don't know how it's going to happen or when. But we believe. Then hope flourishes here. Hope when all hope in the normal natural way of things has gone. It can flourish here because nothing is impossible to God. And our faith also grows in this realm as we relocate and we live from this place. Now we're not called to live in denial of what is happening, the current state of things and our circumstances, we're not called to deny that at all. We're not, we don't have to kiss our brains goodbye. Taking stock of the situation and where we're at is absolutely fine, it's okay. So long as we look at it from standing on the promise and the faith, faith realm that we have now relocated to. In verse 19 it says that Abraham did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, and it, or when he considered the barrenness of his wife's womb. It is fine. We can do that without weakening our faith. Bill Johnson from uh, a church in California, Bethel, says um, that truth is superior to fact. The truth of God's promise sits over us and that's what we're looking to, even though we are living in the, the factual part of our lives of what's, what's happening today. We are still looking and believing and waiting for the fulfilment of that promise. So, we've had establish the promise and, and believe God. The third and final thing is get to know the promise giver. Now someone once said that we are interested in outcomes Whereas he, God, is more interested in the journey. Between the promise being given and the fulfilment of that promise lies a unique opportunity for us to draw closer to God and to grow in our faith in God. And this is a sacred space. It's a meeting place that is only accessible through faith. And Abraham, it says in verse 20, he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. And in this space of time, whether it's days, weeks, months or years, however long it is for your promise to be fulfilled or to start to see that being fulfilled, we get this time to walk with God and we get a chance to know him, to trust him, to love him, to worship him 
in that realm where faith has to be exercised. And okay, some days it can be difficult. Some days it's darn right painful. Even more so if we lose sight of the promise and of God. But we embrace the grind because he is with, it, he is with us in it and he will get us through it. So how do we know the promise giver? Well, a great way to start is to start God gazing. Start reading the Bible, looking at who he is, finding out all you can about him, about the one who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. We think on him, we ponder who he is. We interact with him, we pray, we talk. We listen, we ask questions. You can ask questions, um, Abraham did. Abraham asked God questions about the promise. And so we can do that and we can even remind God of the promises. It says in Isaiah, God says, um, put me in remembrance of what I've spoken. So God's saying to us, you know, remind me of my promise. Stand on my promise when you come to me. And of course, this will overflow into worship as we praise and thank the one who has given us this wonderful promise. And in this sacred space of opportunity, let us get to know the promise keeper. And so in conclusion, I'd just like to say that a couple of weeks ago, Selva, um, he spoke about pleasing God. And he said something that was really profound and it really touched my heart. And it was this, he said, life on earth is the only opportunity we have to please God. And Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, we cannot please God. So, in these situations where God has given us a promise and we are in that special moment where we are believing in faith that God will bring that to pass, will make good on the promise, I pray that we would see it as a unique opportunity to please God, to know God as we have faith in him. And I want to urge you to know and stand the promises on the promises of God that are over your life, just as Abraham did. Regardless of how pear-shaped life seems to be going, I encourage you to press into him. In Isaiah 49, 23, God says, those who wait for me shall never be ashamed. Trust the one who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist because nothing is impossible to God and he loves you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna, for sharing that helpful insight with us about God's promises. So if you have unfulfilled promises over your life, then why not pray about it right now? Should we do that? Please join me in a prayer. Father God, thank you for your promises. And thank you for your specific words and promises over each one of us. We want to engage with you in your promises. We want you to establish them. We want to believe in you for them. We want to engage with you to get to know the promise maker. Amen. And if you'd like to know more about Jesus, 
then please go to our website, which will pop up along the bottom of this um, talk. And um, there you can contact us for a contact form and we'd be delighted to reply to you and point you in the right direction. But for now, have a good week and see you again soon.